We are very grateful today to have Mark Muller, Professor Mark Muller from UC Berkeley. Uh, Mark did his studies initially for bachelor's at the University of Pretoria, followed by master's at ETH Zurich at Mechanical Engineering, and then PhD at IDSC, together with Professor Raf Dandera. Uh, expect to see very cool work related to air robotics. And uh, if you have any question afterwards, feel free to ask Mark, of course. And Mark will present both his work during the previous years, as well as ongoing activities now at UC Berkeley. So thanks a lot, and welcome, Mark. Yeah, thank you very much, Kostos. Thank you for the invitation. It's my first time at Reno, so I'm very happy to be here. Uh, very warm welcome so far. So I think this is not the title that I promised. I'm sorry, I just realized this now. Um, I want to talk to you about our research. And our research is focused on small unmanned aerial vehicles primarily. So small flying robots. And I think this will come as no surprise to all of you since you know some of the Kostos has been working on here at, at least. Um, the small flying vehicles are very interesting for a couple of reasons. And I think the main reason they're interesting is that you're able to move very quickly through environments. Um, in many ways, it's easier to fly through environments than it is to locomote in different ways. And what I mean by that is, if you imagine wanting to move from this side of the room to, well, I guess here it doesn't really work, but let's say to that door over there. Uh, if you want to do it with a ground-based robot, you'd have to navigate quite a lot of obstacles on the way. But if you can fly, um, it's a very simple thing, right? Once you move up, it's a straight line. So in 3D, the world is just a lot emptier uh, than it is in 2D, so you get to move much easier. In some other ways, it's often easier to fly simply because the um, physics are more predictable. And what I mean by that is that once you're flying, the air is pretty much always the air. But on the ground, uh, you have to worry about contact conditions, you have to worry about uh, loose gravel, for example, carpets uh, versus slippery surfaces, etc. So this is much more uh, difficult, I think, in a way, dynamic sometimes when you're not flying than if you are flying. Of course, flight has many disadvantages, right? So uh, the moment you're flying, you have to carry mass, and carrying mass has to energy. Uh, and typically what this means is that there's a very strong trade-off between you know, how far you can operate or how long you can operate, how much sensing you have available, uh, how much actuation you have available, etc. Right? So this energy boundless is one of the big challenges I think that there is in, in deploying these uh, small aerial robots more widely. The other challenge is that uh, these vehicles tend to be inherently dangerous in the sense that whenever you're flying, you have sort of a minimum amount of potential energy that you carry with you. So when you're driving on the ground, you can always just sort of jump on the brakes and you have sort of safe motion to come to zero energy. When you're flying, that's not possible. If you lose uh, sight of where you are in the world, there's no good strategy for to recover from that. And finally, it's very hard to interact with the environment, right? So if you wanted to open a door, uh, designing a flying robot that can actually grasp the door, handle, and reliably operate it is much more difficult uh, than doing a ground robot. If only because of the ground robot, I can sort of put an arbitrary amount of mass. Of course, we've seen these in a lot of places. So Amazon wants to deliver our packages. DJI is selling hundreds of thousands of these drones. Uh, there are some packet delivery uh, projects that are actually somewhat underway already. Amazon is still a bit aspirational, but uh, DHL has been doing some limited deliveries. Um, of course, in Berkeley, there's CG Robotics, and there's similar companies that are interested in doing precision agriculture. As you can imagine, as a farmer, it might be very valuable if you effectively have this small satellite that you can launch once a day to survey your farm. And this will work if there's cloud cover and normal satellites don't work. Uh, you can still use something like this. Finally, and this is something I'll get back to sort of near the end, uh, you can use these drones for other applications as well. So here you see an actor that's doing a performance piece where the drones act as uh, props on stage, right? So these are sort of special effects that you can now use as well. Um, so you can use these to sort of expand uh, sort of in different ways than you might maybe expect, or these are quite utilitarian compared to that. Each of these cases, the more autonomous you are, the more valuable you are, right? Clearly, Amazon does not want to hire 10,000 pilots to fly uh, per city because that will never be profitable. So you need these things to be autonomous. Okay, so what I want to talk about sort of breaks into three parts. The first two parts is mostly old work, um, but I can go into a lot of detail. There's a lot of publications, so I mean, it's, it's all been published and um, sort of peer-reviewed. So uh, I want to talk about trajectory generation, so how we think about planning for these vehicles. Um, specifically being computationally cheap and being fast. I want to talk about rotating vehicles, and this will be sort of the dynamics part. So those of you that enjoy dynamics, this will be for you. Uh, and we'll talk about what happens if you have these vehicles rotating and the interesting effects that you get to exploit once that happens. And then finally, I want to talk about some ongoing work that we have. This will be relatively high level since there's not that many publications out yet. So I just want to sort of give you a flavor of it. And then I'm very happy to discuss it informally afterwards. 
And I think we'll have some time afterwards as well, so if you one on one questions, we'll go here. Uh, so first of all, trajectory generation. So obviously, once you have one of these things flying, you want to go somewhere. How do you, how do, you do that? How do you plan them out? So we looked at the problem of real-time trajectory generation, where we we're trying to move state to state. And what I mean by that is have the vehicle um, have a certain initial condition, which might include position, velocity, and orientation. Uh, and the final condition includes all of these things potentially as well. So it's not just moving from one position to a different position, but sort of a richer problem, uh, which includes that, of course, as a special case too. Important is that we exploit the dynamics of the vehicle. Uh, and I mean this in two senses. One, obviously, to create the trajectories, but two, we want to be fast. Right? So these vehicles are agile. We know that from what human pilots can do with them. So we want to get something that is similar, right? that sort of gives us all of the capabilities of the system uh, when we're running it. We also want to be fast in terms of computation, right? So we want to be able to run this on cheap hardware. And fast here, I mean, like, we want to be able to generate something like a million trajectories per second on a laptop computer. And I'll, I'll give you an example of why this might be interesting, uh, this number. So how do quadcopters work? So a very high level overview. Um, so a quadcopter, of course, has four propellers. They're typically arranged in a rotationally symmetric way around the center of mass. Two of the propellers will rotate in a clockwise direction and two in a counterclockwise. Maybe it's the other way around, like a digital clock, but you get the idea. Um, and by mixing the forces, you can produce uh, total force and three torque components, right? So if I want to rotate the vehicle, I can rotate in any of the three axes, I can produce a torque. And then the total force is just the sum of the four propellers. So if I want to make this formal, we can talk about the acceleration of the vehicle, uh, the change of momentum here according to Newton's law as a function of the rotation matrix R, so the orientation of the vehicle. The four motor forces, so these would be the scalar forces of each of these. And then, of course, the acceleration due to gravity, which pulls you down to Earth. The orientation of the vehicle involves, according to this differential equation here, so this is the rotation matrix R. Uh, P, Q, and R are the three components of angular velocity, so the roll rate, the pitch rate, and the yaw rate. Um, and if you collect them into this vector, you can look at the differential equation for this vector. And this is a much uglier differential equation than the one which we've had so far. Uh, and it comes from you know, sort of the complexities of time derivatives in rotating frames. So this is if you just take Euler's law and you express the change of angular momentum of the vehicle, um, you get this rather ugly set of equations, which includes the angular momentum of the vehicle at this instant in time, the angular momentum of the propellers, and then of course the torques that you produce, where the torques are typically the effect of the motor forces. Um, and what we want to do, of course, now is generate a sort of uh, a trajectory of forces, so a function for the forces over time that take the vehicle from some initial state to final state while satisfying this differential equation. That's sort of the trajectory generation problem. And when you look at this set of equations here, this is kind of difficult because it's a nonlinear equation uh, and has this extremely nasty term here. So that sort of complicates the trajectory generation. So the way we get around this ugliness is we cheat. And the way we cheat is we ignore this ugly equation. We ignore the attitude dynamics. Um, the reason we get to do this is these kinds of vehicles have the propellers at a distance from the center of mass, so you tend to produce very large torques, right, since that distance is so large. At the same time, the mass moment of inertia tends to be relatively low. So if you combine these two things, these vehicles are able to generate extremely high angular accelerations. So what we do is we hide this differential equation in a very stiff inner loop controller, uh, and then we can treat the angular velocities, P, Q, and R, as instantaneous inputs compared to the rest of the dynamics. Right? So they can change quickly enough uh, that you can assume you can instantaneously set an angular velocity and the vehicle is able to track it. If you do that, your system reduces to this differential equation, still with four inputs, but now instead of the four inputs being the four motor forces, the four inputs are the three components of angular velocity and the total force that you wish to produce. Now, as long as these dynamics are sufficiently slower than the PQR dynamics, which they will be simply by nature of the geometry of one of these vehicles, this is a reasonable assumption, right? And it becomes much easier to do your planning, since this equation is much nicer than this set of equations. <coughs> so what we now want to do is we can only come up with PQR and total thrust force C, trajectories over time. Uh, the way we do that is in a two-step approach. So what we'll do first is we'll generate an open loop motion without regard for feasibility. Feasibility, I mean that the motor forces have to be within the lower and upper bounds that they can actually produce, um, and that you don't collide with obstacles, for example, the floors and the walls, etc. 
um, and that you don't command angular velocities, for example, that are more than you could measure with your rate gyroscopes. So these are the few. But we're going to do this in this two-step approach. So first, generate the trajectory and then test it for feasibility. Afterwards, this is in uh, contrast to the typical MPC approach, where you do these two in one big loop, right? Where you plan and uh, verify it in the same uh, loop. So the way we generate these trajectories is through exploiting differential flatness. So what we're doing effectively is we're cheating again. So instead of planning in the angular velocity directly, we plan in the jerk of the trajectory, which is the third derivative of position. So position and velocity acceleration jerk. If you do this and you treat each spatial axis independently, you get three subsystems that you have to plan for. Each of these is a triple integrate. This is, of course, a very nice linear problem, so it tends to be easy to solve. And it turns out that if I have a jerk trajectory, I can recover the inputs that I'm interested in through these equations, right? So it's pretty straightforward. If you give me a jerk trajectory, I can compute what the angular velocity is, as well as the total force along the way. To make this concrete, we then pose an optimal control problem where we try to minimize the jerk squared over the duration of the trajectory t. Now, what's nice about this Euclidean norm, of course, is that it's the sum of squares which means that I can solve each axis independently. So each spatial axis decouples into its own optimal control problem. I solve each spatial axis independently as a triple integrator, and then I combine these back <coughs> to get the 3D solution. And by nature of the Euclidean norm, this is still optimal for the combined problem. And then this optimal control here, it seems a bit arbitrary. Why minimize jerk squared? It doesn't have much to do with the vehicle, but it turns out that the jerk squared acts as an upper bound on the inputs to these vehicles. So if I push down the jerk of the vehicle, I also push down the aggressiveness of the inputs that I do care about, of the total thrust and of the angular velocity along the trajectory. And now if you plug all of these things in uh, to the math, you get that you can actually solve this in closed form. So online, I just have to evaluate a couple of polynomials to get the entire trajectory for the vehicle. Of course, so far, this has said nothing about feasibility. So does the vehicle come on thrust that are feasible along the trajectory or not? It turns out from these polynomials, you can sort of extract some upper and lower bounds for the inputs along the trajectory of the vehicle. Um, and then you can use these to guarantee that a trajectory is either definitely feasible, definitely infeasible, or you can't yet tell. Uh, and of course, if you can't tell, uh, you're kind of stuck. So what you do is if you halve the trajectory, and you look at the first half of the trajectory independently of the second half, these bounds become tighter. And as you keep halving, they become tighter and tighter still. So you see on this figure, is sort of a cartoon of this action. So this is the thrust of the vehicle along some trajectory starting at some initial value, and this is where we want to end, with the minimum and maximum allowed. Now, the polynomial would give us this exact shape, but we don't want to evaluate this online, right? So we don't want to compute all of these points. So what we instead do is we can very cheaply compute these upper and lower bounds, this green line here and here. Uh, and we do this by, again, evaluating a set of polynomials, in effect, four polynomials um, once, so rather than evaluating a bunch of points. In this case, the, the bounds are outside that is allowed, so I don't actually know that this is feasible, so I start halving the trajectory, and the bounds will shrink. And as we keep halving them, they become tighter and tighter. And what we get to do is we get to guarantee that this motion will be feasible by evaluating it only to a handful of points. Right? So rather than evaluating the trajectory exhaustively, you just choose these few bounds of points, and then you can guarantee feasible. And of course, the key here is that's very fast. Right? So we're aiming at that speed. Putting these things together, we're able to generate the trajectory and test it for feasibility on the order of, um, let's check the number here, uh, roughly one microsecond per trajectory. So generate the open loop motion and then test it for feasibility because it's evaluating effectively just a few polynomials that are a function of your initial conditions. Now, why would I care about acting that quickly? There's no way the vehicle can respond to anything in that time. So what is the good of being able to, to generate motions and plans that so the example problem that we chose to illustrate where this would be useful is to try and hit a ball that you throw at the vehicle back to where it comes from. So this is kind of like playing tennis, and I guess all of us have some intuition for what it's like to play ball sports. So when you're trying to strike a ball towards a target, you actually have a lot of freedom in how you do this, right? So where you hit the ball, where you intercept it on its trajectory, but then also how the ball returns to the other side, right? Do you hit it with some high velocity that goes straight? Do you try to arc it high, etc. So what we do is we have a receding horizon style trajectory generation uh, where every 20 milliseconds we evaluate 10,000 different trajectories that would intercept the ball and hit it back towards the target. 
right? So these 10,000 are chosen by just doing sort of brute force search of possibilities. Uh, and out of these 10,000, many will be infeasible, right? So they'll either have too large thrust values, they'll fly into the ground, they'll fly into the ceiling, something like this. But of those that are feasible, and hopefully there would be some, given that you're searching over this many, um, you take that trajectory which is least aggressive, right, which leaves you somehow the most in reserve in the future, and you apply 20, 20 milliseconds worth of uh, the inputs. 20 milliseconds later, you repeat this entire process. Of course, then you have more information about what the ball is doing, you have information about the disturbances acting on your vehicle, uh, so you can then sort of, in one loop, both do the trajectory planning as well as the feedback control to react to the disturbances. So what does this look like in real time? So this is the drone with the rack accounts on top. What you don't see in this video is the motion capture system. So there's a set of cameras um, in the ceiling. So just so that you understand, we're not doing the estimation on the vehicle at all. Uh, so the ball is being tracked by the motion capture and the vehicle is being tracked by the motion. Computation is done on the PC, on the ground, and then we send a uh, command to the vehicle. So what happens is you throw the ball and then the vehicle has to hit it back towards you. And what you see in this is roughly how much time you have available, right? So it's very quick uh, action. And what's interesting for the research is that this is not something I can pre-plan, right? So I don't know how the ball is going to fly each time. And the, the racket has a sweet spot that's about the size uh, of, you know, that's about 10 centimeters across. So you need to be quite precise. So you have to really do this online. Okay, so that's what it looks like uh, in real time. So let's look at what's happening behind the scenes. So what you'll see here is a freeze frame, and then how we predict the ball is going to fly over time. And what you see here is five different candidate motions at this instant in time that would strike the ball at different points along its trajectory. Uh, and all of them returning sort of with the same amount of energy back towards the target. The red candidate here is the one that we ended up choosing. So one of the degrees of freedom that we search over is where you hit the ball. Another thing we search over is how high the ball flies on its way back. So here again, the same time is the same ball's prediction. Uh, but now the, the different candidates strike at the same point, but hit the ball back to a different arc. Right, so you can see if I want to hit the ball high, I need to have more energy when I strike the ball. Uh, and the optimum is somewhere in the, in the middle. Okay, so at this time, the instant where we shot this photograph, uh, there were about 11,000 trajectories evaluated on this. So sort of clip, you will see 10% roughly, so you get some idea of how densely we can search over the space. And what we do now is we determine that that red motion was the least aggressive one that does not violate any of the constraints and that does not collide with any of the surfaces, and we execute 20 milliseconds worth of this. 20 milliseconds later, we repeat. And that's what you'll see in this video. So here you'll just see the optimal trajectory and the optimal return path that we have. And then you'll see how this is updated as we get more information about the ball and the part of the space. So you might object now and say, okay, but I've never heard anyone complain that their drones aren't good enough to play tennis, so why am I feeling not be interested in this? But it turns out that if you wanted to land on a moving platform, for example, or uh, intercept with a target uh, in the air, it's a very similar problem to this. Right? So you have to plan a motion that intercepts with a certain state at a certain uh, point in time, and you typically have some freedom, right? So if you, if you imagine trying to land on a target, you can land now or you can land with laser, right? So when, when is the right time? And rather than trying to answer the question formally, when is the best time, you just evaluate all of the possibilities. Because this is fast enough that you can get close to evaluating all the possibilities, uh, and then you can just choose the best motion from that set. Another place this might be useful is in sort of emergency maneuvers. If you have something pop up as you're trying to deliver your packages and you want to just avoid it as quickly as possible, this might be a way of evaluating a set of trajectories that all avoid uh, the obstacle uh, that you weren't expecting if you have been planning. Okay, so that's sort of how we think about trajectory planning. And the key is sort of we want to be able to use the model and then be fast, right? So we want to exploit the dynamics. I want to talk next about this idea of rotating vehicles and how we will use this to generate safer drones. And that was sort of motivation really was to think about safer drones. Now, you know, Amazon says it's going to be delivering packages, so you'll have thousands of these drones flying overhead in Reno. Um, and you want to be reasonably sure that this isn't going to happen, right? Or at least that if this happens, it's not the end of the world, this drone doesn't land on your head. 
So we were thinking about what happens with these quadcopters if you lose an actuator, right? And it seems like you're sort of doomed to fail. If you lose one of the four motors, you have to crash. And what people typically do, you know, in this spirit is they add more propellers, right? So the cheap vehicles tend to have four propellers. Then as you become more expensive, you have maybe six. Amazon's first prototype had eight propellers. This thing that's carrying a human has 16 propellers. And the idea is simple, right? The more actuators I have, the less it matters if an actuator fails, right? But we ask ourselves, is there an alternative to this? Can I get away with fewer components? And the reason fewer components are interesting is, of course, it's cheaper, uh, at least sort of in a naive first order sense. The fewer motors I need to buy, the less money I'm spending. Fewer components typically need, need less mechanical structure, right? So you end up with a lighter vehicle, which actually makes it safer since you have less energy stored. And somewhat counterintuitively, and this is controversial, uh, but fewer components means that there's less likelihood of a component failing, right? So if I have four motors, there's four that can fail. If I have eight motors, suddenly there's eight points of failure. Um, and what I like to say, although this is the most controversial, is that you know, as a pilot, you probably want to plane with one engine rather than two engines, because it's easier to maintain one engine well than maintain two engines well. So we asked ourselves this question, is it possible to hover with these vehicles with fewer than four propellers? Because then you have the four propeller vehicle that actually is already redundant. So why is this an interesting question to ask? So if I have four propellers, I can use these four forces that I'm producing to independently create a three-dimensional torque vector, so torque anywhere around the body, and a total thrust force. And specifically, I can balance the torques to be zero when I'm producing a force. So if I want to hover, I can produce the weight of the vehicle in force with the zero torque. And clearly that is when all four are producing the same force. If I take away one of these motors, this is no longer true. If I want to produce a certain three-dimensional torque, so I still have three numbers that I get to choose, I have three forces, so I can produce a torque, but then my force is fixed. Alternatively, if I choose the force, there's no way to have zero torque, right? So I cannot stand still. So you might imagine, okay, I'll turn this motor off, but since these two turn in the same direction, the vehicle will start to rotate in the opposite sense. So it's not clear how you would do this. And the idea is then, okay, let's not stand still, let's let the vehicle rotate. And as it's rotating, maybe we can control it uh, in the rotation. Okay, so with this idea then, of course, you start with the model again. Um, the model for these vehicles that we're now doing is, is the same picture. We're just freeing up the number of, of motors and propellers, uh, and they no longer need to be symmetric, right? So we're just sort of considering an arbitrary configuration with propellers all pointing in the same direction. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then you have Newton's law again, so the acceleration of a function of the force, uh, the weight of the vehicle, the rotation matrix. Rotation evolves according to this differential equation with the angular velocity, and the angular velocity with this ugly differential equation here. I want to spend a bit more time looking at it now. So this is the angular acceleration of the vehicle, the angular acceleration of the propellers. So this is the change of angular momentum of the propellers. Then you have this term here, omega cross angular momentum, omega cross i omega. This is the term that appears because we're taking a time derivative in a non-inertial frame. So you have this correction term that appears. Uh, and then you have, of course, the torques that you can produce. And these torques that you can produce, we are considering two types of torque. The first is from the motors themselves. So clearly, the force acting at a distance from the center of mass creates a moment. There's also a moment that is in the sense of rotation of the propeller. This is because you're putting power into the propeller to create the force. Uh, this power is in rotation, so there is a natural reaction torque acting on the frame. And then finally, we're considering sort of all of the other drag torques acting on the vehicle because these vehicles will be rotating at speed. This is saying that there's some drag damping effectively as a torque as well. So we asked ourselves, can you hover? Can you hover these vehicles if you're going for The answer is yes, you can. How is that possible? Well, we redefine what we mean by hover, right? So we're kind of uh, making up the word a little bit anew. And what we mean by hover is the following. Uh, hover is no longer just standing still, but we generalize this to an average standing still. So on average you have zero acceleration, and from the perspective of the vehicle, everything is constant. Right? So if you're sitting on the vehicle, everything is time invariant. If you're standing on the ground, it might look like something is moving. Right? But from the vehicle's perspective, everything is constant, and from the ground, the vehicle isn't sort of accelerating to the side. Right? So on average at the same position. 
If you now take these two constraints and you apply them to those equations, you get some algebraic constraints. So first of all, average acceleration means that over some period t, if I integrate the acceleration, this is equal to zero. And then constant in the body frame, specifically the angular velocity should be constant, gives you this algebraic nonlinear equation in the angular velocity and the force. If you massage this a bit, you find out that for these solutions, the angular velocity is either zero, which is the one that we all know, or the angular velocity is parallel to gravity, right? So either it's rotating upwards or rotating downwards. And the position trajectory will be a periodic motion, and specifically the vehicle will move along a circle, right? So if I'm looking from the ground, the vehicle will be sort of uh, moving along a circle. So what does this look like? If you have a crop top to weigh five newtons, so about one pound, um, each motor, when I have four, produces a quarter of the vehicle's weight, and you have zero angular velocity, right? This is the classical hover speed. Then I take away one of these four motors, I now need to produce more force with two of the motors. So instead of one newton, they're now producing two newtons. Uh, the third motor is still helping, right? So this motor is still producing force. And the vehicle is rotating at the equilibrium. It's rotating relatively quickly on the order of 20 radians per second or about 3 hertz. So 3 rotations per second. If I take away yet another motor, and what I'm showing is the symmetric case, the motor forces go up, right, as you might expect, fewer motors, so they each have to carry more. And the speed goes up. So now the vehicle rotates about 30 radians per second, about 5 hertz. Um, and these are, the, these are the three configurations that you can fly experimentally with this drone. You can find solutions for two adjacent motors having failed and for three motors having failed. The problem is then you need forces that you cannot produce on these motors. Uh, so we cannot actually fly those. But each of these you can fly and I'd like to show you how this works. Before we get there though, I need to explain how do you actually control the vehicle. So this was computing the equilibrium. So if you add the equilibrium, you stay there. But of course, you need to be able to reject disturbances and reach the equilibrium from somewhere else. So to understand how to control this vehicle, we're going to look at this case having only two propellers. And why is this tricky? It's tricky because I cannot produce a torque around this axis. Right? So if I had uh, an angular velocity that I cancel around this axis, there's no way to directly create a torque around that axis. What I can do is I can create a torque around this axis and around the thrust axis by mixing the two forces. The way to get around this is to have the vehicle rotate around its thrust axis, which it will naturally do because both of these motors produce the torque in the same direction, so the vehicle has a tendency to rotate. And as it is rotating, we get to use this attitude coupling, this omega cross i omega term. And what specifically we do is we'll have a very large angular momentum about the thrust axis, then we can create an angular velocity around the second direction, and then omega cross i omega means that there will be a rate in the third linearly independent direction. Right? So we can cause an acceleration. Uh, basically by having an additional integrator appear in the system dynamics through the rotation dynamics here. So if you do this, you can write down a linearized system for the attitude control. Uh, I just want to show you what it looks like because I think it's very pretty. Um, so if you have the states being four-dimensional, so the two components of angular velocity, roll rate and pitch rate, assuming that the yaw rate is pretty constant because it's a relatively large number, and it's dominated by the drag of the vehicle, so that'll be pretty constant. Uh, and you're interested in controlling the thrust direction, so where you're pointing, right? So if you can control the thrust direction, I can control the acceleration of the vehicle. The input that I have available for the axis is the difference between the two forces, right? So effectively, the torque around this axis. If I do the math, I get the following linear system. What I'm going to out is that this is a very nice linear system, right? Lots of zeros and ones, and only sort of two interesting numbers. So R bar is the rate at which this vehicle is rotating, uh, so the yaw rate, and then A bar is this coupling term, which is a function of the geometry of the vehicle, so the mass moment of inertia of the vehicle. And what we see is if you sort of play with this equation, is there's two non-trivial cases where you cannot possibly control such a vehicle. Uh, and it happens when this A bar quantity is equal to R bar, or when it's equal to, I think, minus R. And these two are geometrically quite intuitive. It's when the vehicle is flat, so if you have a pancake-like vehicle, uh, it turns out you cannot fly it like this. Or if the vehicle has a uh, symmetric mass distribution, so if it's somehow built like a sphere. Uh, in that case, also, the cross-coupling disappears and you cannot control the vehicle. Looking at this equation, it's also obvious that if the vehicle were not rotating, these two terms would be zero, and the vehicle is also not controllable. 
right? So if you don't have this vehicle rotating, you cannot possibly control the orientation. So you might think, okay, I'm just going to build my drone with two propellers rotating the opposite direction, then I can have zero torque, but then you cannot control the vehicle in this way. Okay, so that's all the derivations. What is this good for? Um, so we're going to show you here is a video of a drone. So you can ignore that one. That's just video taping. This drone here is going to take off, and it's going to experience a failure. And once this failure occurs, it's going to use this control strategy to recover. So we're looking at the vehicle's right hand side propeller, so the propeller here, from the vehicle. It's missing here is the nut that holds the propeller drop down. So through the vibrations, this will come loose. Now what you see in this video is the failure occurs and then immediately the vehicle tips over, right? That's kind of what you would expect because of the large torque imbalance that the vehicle experiences. Uh, but once it's tipped over, we detect that something is going on. We switch to this alternative control mode uh, where the vehicle starts rotating slower. So this is in slow motion. This is the failure and you'll see it falls off. Now we've detected something, so we're trying to build up the angular momentum by having the vehicle rotate. And once the vehicle is sufficiently rotated, we can use this control strategy to bring the vehicle back to its original position. And we can really control the vehicle back to where it was before, and you know, in principle, hover until the battery fails, right? And bring it back for soft landing. We can also use this to build new vehicles. I want to talk specifically about one of these vehicles, uh, since it's kind of a fun design, and it shows that you can do this with only a single input. So we built sort of a family of these things, um, and this one here was the most extreme, it's the monospinner. And our claim is that it's the mechanically simplest controllable flying vehicle. And conceptually, it's a brick to which you attach a propeller. So what you see in this picture is the motor with the propeller on one edge of this Y shape, there's a battery, and then there's the flight electronics. There are no other aerodynamic surfaces, so there's no flaps, there's no passive aerodynamics, um, and there are no <coughs> other inputs, right? So the only thing you can control is the speed of this motor. Uh, and then we can use the same sort of idea to control it in flight. So what you'll see here is what it looks like when it's flying. So this is just the vehicle hovering. You can imagine that the center of mass is doing this very rapid circular motion. And you can see that the thrust vector is sort of pointing to the side, right? It's pointing inwards. Again, of course, motion capture to get the state estimate. How do you get this thing in the air? Clearly, if I just put it on the ground and start using force, it's going to fall over. So what we discovered you can actually do, and this works surprisingly well, is just throw it like a frisbee. So you throw it like a frisbee, this both gets it in the air, as well as gives it this initial angular momentum to get going, and then you can use this magic wand to pilot it around. So this just shows that it really is a controllable vehicle, right? It's not just hovering in place, but you can actually fly it to points in the world that you like. We spend quite a bit of energy thinking about how do you design such a vehicle, or how do you build it so that it's likely to work, right? Because you have only one input, it's very sensitive. Um, and the main thing we sort of play with is where do you put these three massive components? So there are three massive components that are roughly the same mass. It's the motor, the battery, and the electronics. So we sort of play with the relative locations. And I won't talk too much about this, but uh, in simulation and using sort of uh, control theoretic, robust control type tools, we analyze for different designs how likely is it that in flight, given a certain assumption about disturbances, they experience actuator saturation. And then we move this design around to that point where it's least likely to saturate based on the noise, and that's where this shape that you see here comes from. That's why it has this funny shape. Clearly, it was very important to be lightweight, right? We have only one motor, so you have to be extremely lightweight. So everything is carbon fiber. We also commercialized this. Um, so the idea is you have these vehicles that can now reliably fly with two propellers. So how can I use this? One idea is don't just build a quadcopter that you can lose one propeller off. Build two separate vehicles. Each of them is capable of flying with two motors, and then glue them together. Right? They're totally independent. Each has its own battery pack, each has its own electronics, uh, and each has its own uh, flight control. And this was work done with Verity Studios, which is a Switzerland-based company that works with these drones. Uh, and they developed this well, they built this concept with the two independent uh, vehicles, effectively just glued together. And I spent some time working there as well. Using this, they were then confident enough to try and sell this in situations where safety might otherwise be considered too risky. And the specific, uh, you know, the most high-profile thing that they had 
done while I was there was this work on Broadway. So we went to uh, the Lyric Theatre in New York. Broadway is the biggest theatre in New York, where Cirque du Soleil was putting on this Paramore show. And I want to show you a quick clip of what the show is about, and I'll talk about what the drones do in the show. So Cirque du Soleil, of course, is known for these spectacular, visually overwhelming displays with acrobats and you know, things on the stage moving. Uh, and they were interested in adding these flight elements, sort of an additional uh, special effect that they can use. So in this video, it, it sort of spliced together from the publicly available footage. It turns out that they're extremely copyright sensitive, so I can't show anything in more detail. Um, but this is spliced together. This will just give you an idea of what the vehicles look like in the show. And for context, this is about one minute uh, in the two-hour show where the drones fly, so it's a very small part of the big show. Um, but you'll see eight drones flying directly over the actors, and without any special protective netting separating the drones from the audience. Right? So there's nothing that, uh, beyond the algorithms and the design of the vehicle, that prevents them from crashing into people. And of course the key is that these are eight drones flying eight shows per week. Uh, this theatre has a capacity of 2,000. So if something goes wrong and if your drone causes the show to stop, it's a lot of money that uh, we lost. Uh, and of course in addition to not wanting to injure anyone. So it's extremely important that these vehicles are reliable. Uh, and with this technology, there was actually there were no flight incidents. Uh, kind of disappointing is that we never got to use the failsafe in action. Uh, in a sense, but you know, the, the vehicles were judged sufficiently safe that the insurance got played along with the building played along, etc. And the circus was comfortable putting this on stage. Okay, and then I want to talk about some of the things we're doing now. So one of them is cooperative localization. Uh, this is in the lab in Berkeley. So what we're interested in is we're flying these drones in environments where perhaps you don't have the motion capture that we've been using so far, right? So motion capture is really nice in closed spaces, but it's expensive and you can't really move it without spending a couple of days setting it up and calibrating it. So one of the technologies is using ultra-wideband radios uh, to construct GPS-like systems. So GPS, of course, works by measuring time of flight effectively to things that have known position. So you use the same kind of idea uh, with these ultra-wideband radios. What's nice about ultra-wideband radios is that they're quite cheap, they're quite small, and you can get away with relatively low computational power. So if you compare this to vision-based approaches, you tend to have smaller things that you can work with, uh, and potentially better robustness in the sense that uh, it doesn't matter how the visibility is, it doesn't matter if it's light or dark, it doesn't matter if it's smoke. Of course, the downside is someone with a Wi-Fi jammer would really uh, mess with the system. So the robustness is kind of in a different sense. And we're really using this on flying vehicles. And it's not only because we like flight, but it's also because flight is challenging. And as you're estimating where you are, uh, if you can do it in closed loop in flight, it means that you're doing a very good job at estimating. Right? So if you're driving on the ground and something goes wrong with your estimator, it's sort of an okay thing to do to so stop, reset everything, and then to restart. But in flight, if something bad happens, you're going to hit the ground before your estimator figures out how to reboot itself. So it's a very challenging system to work on, and that I think makes it an interesting uh, platform to push these things. So one of the things we are interested in is, as we sort of have a set of these radios that you deploy in your space that you might be interested in flying, you have to think about how you use them, right? So it's a, you have a limited resource in which radio you talk to at a certain instant in time. So at any instant in time, I can decide to measure distance to one of these anchors in the world, to one of these fixed infrastructure points. So how do you reason about which one to use and do this in a computationally efficient way? Again, we're interested in working in small drones. Uh, small microcontrollers uh, and getting away with, with cheap computation. 
And then we were working on, so this is something that we submitted the paper on, this is still under review, but we're working on extending it is having these things now be mobile, right? So instead of the human placing these things in the space, you have this team of robots that construct together a localization system. So as they move through the space, they construct this localization, and they continuously move to optimize for sensitivity uh, where it's interesting for you to be. So if you wanted to inspect a bridge, for example, you know where you want to go, then everyone else sort of arranges themselves to help you do that as well as possible. We're also quite interested in this topic of resilience uh, UAVs. So when we're thinking about this external things causing you to lose a motor, but what if it doesn't break you? What if it just causes a large disturbance? How do you build vehicles and how do you think about the control to react to these disturbances as well as you can? So the comic is someone shoots you, but you can think of just sort of flying in very windy environments or environments where there are strong wind gradients, right? So where you have, for example, no wind, and then you leave the edge of the building and suddenly there's 10 meters per second, right? And that'll act as a very large disturbance. So one of the sort of small results that we've got in the lab is playing with uh, having large impulses. So we got some funding to shoot drones. Uh, we didn't actually shoot them, but we simulated them being shot. And we played with trying to come up with control strategies that maximize the minimum height, so reduce the height loss based on large disturbances. Um, and this is interesting because as a control problem, you can sort of state it pretty easily and you can play with the solution. And the constraints that you're playing with are the input saturation, so the forces that you can produce, and the angular uh, velocity at the beginning is basically how hard you've been hit. Right? So you can also imagine if you're flying your uh, drone and someone throws a shoe at you, it sort of will give you a very similar behavior. And we looked at sort of a 2D problem since it makes this a smaller state space and less easier to solve. And you get this very sort of kind of obvious uh, behavior. So as the impulse gets larger, so as the initial velocity, angular velocity of the vehicle increases after disturbance, the best you can do, so this is the best trajectory that you can execute how much height you lose, right? And the interest, of course, is don't hit the ground, right? So catch yourself and come back to where you are. You get this very repetitive structure in the behavior, and that's kind of clear because at some point it's better to do a loop around, right? To take the impulse, do a loop, and then just fly back home. And what we're playing with at the moment, and we have some initial results, though nothing that I can present yet, is how do you do this in real time, right? So this is with infinite amount of computational power, basically, on the ground. But if someone hits you, you need to be able to react in an instant to that impulse and choose whether it's better to go around once or not, right? And this becomes very important when you're flying, for example. Uh, over densely populated areas where you might not have a lot of vertical. So some initial results with this, these are with small drones, um, where we have the drone set up to create this initial impulse artificially. So we basically have the vehicle do a flip, and at the end of the flip, it's as though it's been hit, right? And then we try to execute in feedback control uh, the best recovery we can. The challenge, of course, with feedback control is you don't have access to this infinite computational time, right? You really have to react to the uncertain state estimate that you have. You're not really sure of what your angular velocity is, etc. Um, so this then reduces the performance substantially. These are some of the results that we've been able to get, and we found that there's this very sharp drop off uh, in the using the sort of classical controls approaches. And with some new results, we've been able to pull this up, um, but that's not really at the stage to be presented yet. Related to this, though, is how do you build vehicles to be better able to reject these disturbances, right? So what we've talked about in the last slide was just having a typical quadcopter. But let's say I don't have a typical quadcopter. Let's say I redesign this vehicle from scratch, knowing that I'm likely to be hit by external impulses, right? And these external impulses might be as I'm trying to land on this ship. There's a lot of wind shear happening around this, uh, this surface of the ship. Um, or it might be, you know, flying over a crowd of people, someone throws a shoe at your drone, right? So how do you build a drone that is best able to recover from this? Uh, and here I think there's a lot of interesting questions in terms of the mechanical design. And we've sort of played with ideas in terms of changing the shape online and changing the angular momentum of the vehicle to reject these disturbances and tightly couple the controls design with the mechanical design and do these hand in hand rather than the typical approach of building something and then passing it on to the next guy and saying, control it please. That's sort of brings me to the conclusion. Um, lots of people to thank for what I've shown. Uh, so at Berkeley, uh, the people are listed on this website here. So we have a group of about four PhD students, a postdoc, and then a couple of master students working. Uh, at ETH, some of the videos I showed at the beginning, 
a big team of people that worked on making that test bed work. So if I work on a small part of the test bed, so I can't take credit for everything there. And in the company with Broadway, of course, this was a big engineering team, right? So my part was relatively small working on the safety. Clearly, to get something like this working, you had to have a lot of people working with you. Uh, so in summary, we talked about, uh, I guess, this trajectory generation. If you're interested in using something like this, we have open source code that you can just download and play around with, so it should be really easy to redeploy in your context. Uh, I talked about these rotating vehicles, where as you dig into the dynamics, it turns out that there are these rich, uh, modes that you get to exploit when you have these vehicles rotate. And these allow you to do more interesting control strategies than you might be able to otherwise. And finally, I talked a little bit about some of our current projects, uh, sort of at a high level, but I'm very happy to talk to you offline uh, about them in more detail. And of course, if you have further questions, feel free to send me an email. Uh, I'll be happy to ask them. So, any questions now? Thank you very much for your attention. I didn't see who it was. Okay. Yeah. Um, did you have like a threshold when in the uh, when you lose the propeller? How did you detect the state of the lost propeller? So we didn't do anything particularly sophisticated to decide that the failure has occurred. Uh, initially, we thought I could naively like watch it and hit a button, but that's way too slow. Um, so what we did is we looked at the accelerometer and rate gyroscope measurements, and you can detect the failure of the propeller pretty cleanly because you have a thrust drop of 25% uh, very rapidly, and you have very large angular acceleration, which you can infer from the rate gyroscope. And these two basically played with the thresholds a bit, and that's how you detect it. So this was not particularly... Um, Sophisticated, and in fact, when we were doing these experiments, uh, occasionally there would be a false positive, right? So just noise in the system would be you know, pushing you over the edge. In practice, uh, what one might do is you might look at the power that each motor is drawing, right? So if you look at the power that the motor is drawing, you can tell how much torque it's exerting, and if there's a big change in the torque that you're producing compared to what you're commanding, you kind of have an idea that something is going on with that motor. So that's how you would ideally do it. For us, we just had, I mean, the IV was there, it was easy to use, so that's how we did it in this video. I don't want to talk about what the company does, but it's not really good. Um, you had a question as well. Yeah. Uh, can the model spinner achieve its relatively stable flight if dropped from a high altitude rather than thrown to a free spin? Um, Presumably, yes. You'd have to think about how exactly you go about doing this. The challenge is, if you think about this vehicle, right? So you have the force that you're producing and the center of mass might be here. The torque that you're producing around this axis is quite a bit smaller than the torque around this axis, simply because the moment arm is, is large. Uh, so the challenge is, if you have this vehicle that's not rotating, you just turn it on, what will happen is it will tend to rotate in this sense much stronger. Right? So you have to have a strategy to allow you to transition in some way slowly, maybe from one to the other. And that's quite challenging. So the initial strategy we had for launching this was to build this little stand with a bearing that had the vehicle resting on it, and then you slowly ramp up the thrust, and as you ramp up the thrust, it'll start rotating, but not sufficient thrust that actually takes off, right? And then you can build up the angular momentum. If you're just sort of imagining throwing them out of an aeroplane, um, then you'd have to think about something that maybe passively gets you this initial rotation with some flaps. Of course, in practice, you're unlikely to constrain yourself this extremely, right? You want to use some passive aerodynamics. Why not? It's free. You, can, you have it, so why not use it? And you can imagine with that, you might have something where you get enough initial angular rotation uh, that you can then take over with the uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Being for more video, like, how did you detect the ball? So the ball was also um, measured using the uh, mocap system. Uh, so we wrapped the ball in the silver tape, so the ball was uh, effectively seen as a point in the space. Um, and even though the mocap is extremely accurate, it turns out that it's quite hard to predict where these balls fly since they're so light. So it's something I didn't realize, I didn't play much ping pong. Um, but it's very difficult to predict the motion of these balls. Even if you're careful when you're throwing it to not put much angular rotation on it, uh, it turns out to be quite hard. So I think it would be extremely challenging to do something like this without the precision that the mocap gives you, just based on my experience with predicting where the ball is fine. 
So uh, in the data generation, uh, what which state of the robot that you saw in your space? Like uh, only the position? Or? Sorry, I didn't talk about that at all really. So we had a three-dimensional search space. Um, so the, the, the first one is the point along the trajectory where you want to hit the ball. It's effectively a time parameter. The second one is how high the ball should fly on its way back. And the third one was kind of technical. It was the amount of thrust that you want to produce when you hit the ball. Uh, so it turns out when you run this trajectory generator, the thrust profile is continuous. And the thing that you're interested in is the orientation of the vehicle. This is linked to the acceleration to the thrust. So what you specify is an acceleration, but for a certain orientation, there would be a set of thrusts that actually make that orientation true. So there are three search dimensions, and in each of these we just grid it, right? So it's just a naive grid with, I think, 30 points roughly in each direction, and we just multiply those together. Uh, can you comment on that if the mobile accuracy is there, but the feedback uh, rate is lower, for example, in, uh, uh, in terms of a vision system on board, how would the system adapt, or what things would be changed? Um, in the context of specifically one of these projects, or in general? In general. Um, so it's something we played, I played around with very little bit, um, but I don't have any numbers off the top of my head. So we run the mocap system at 200 hertz, uh, and there's no real strong reason except more is more, and we can, so why not? Uh, I know that if you reduce this to 50 hertz, it's still basically fine. And it's because it's so precise, right? You get this to, I mean, I don't know, centimeter accuracy and millimeter precision. And what you really care about typically is the precision. So I can't see if it's maybe five centimeters off, as long as it's stably there. And the mocap is really good for that. Because around this, it'll have that uh, millimeter precision. Once you start degrading that, of course, then it becomes more interesting, right? And then you want to think also about the estimation. Um, in the mocap space, you can do the silliest estimates that you can imagine will work well enough at 200 hertz with this precision, right? It, it, you can hardly do something wrong uh, to get the state estimate. Uh, once you start degrading that, then you want to start thinking about you know, the noises that are acting in the system and trading off measurements and process noises. That's the oh, first of all, thanks a lot. I have an aligned question with the last time. It's similar. So what if you have thought of the following problem? Instead of trying to hit it in the best possible way, what if you impose some uncertainty around how well you know the ball, and you try to make the most confident estimate that right. you will be somewhere close? So it's okay. something that's, that I've always wanted to kind of do, but never did. Um, but that would be probably the better thing to do. So probably you know, subject to a little bit of flexibility still, right? So you want to have something that gives you a little bit of leeway if your estimates change and find that which is most likely to succeed. Right. Um, we've not really looked at how you would do that and, and how the uncertainty exactly would propagate in, in this context. Um, but I think that would be a really interesting challenge. And especially once you start thinking about the, the applications, you know, the real world applications, landing on an uncertain platform, this cartoon I showed you a second ago, uh, this thing, right? let's say on the landing, something like this. Missing the ball, who cares, right? It's a little bit embarrassing. If you crash into the ocean, that's not so good, right? So here, uh, it becomes much more important that you not only get very good performance when it works, which is kind of what we were going for, it rather is that the worst performance is not that bad, right? So I don't care if I can land millimeter accurate as long as I never go more than 20 centimeters. More questions? Did you employ any technique to reduce the subspace uh, in, in your as a No, it no. was totally naive. So we just gridded the space and we searched over it. So clearly that was that's kind of stupid. Um, and you can very easily imagine doing some sort of gradient descent, maybe, right? Or whatever your favorite uh, um, optimization technique is. But we found that we can search fast enough to cover dense enough search space that we are fine. If you run this, so this trajectory generation is run on a standard laptop computer single core. If you run it on a microcontroller, so typical SDM 32F4, at the floating point, but nothing fancy, um, you, it runs about 160 microseconds per trajectory, rather than one microsecond, so 160 times slower. 
So once you start talking about those numbers, then you would have to be more smart, right? So I can compute 160 times fewer trajectories, uh, which means I probably want to be smart about which ones I actually sample. Because, um, for example, in the application landing onto a ship, uh, you, then you have to consider much more variables, much more, much more parameter, right? So the subspace may be really huge. So right, so the unit approach breaks down once you have more parameters, right? So the curse of dimensionality. So certainly, um, in application, you probably want to tweak that. But our focus was really to show that it's fast and that it's flexible. Um, so we did the stupidest search because the point was not that if you use smart search, but even if you do stupid search, uh, you can still get a reasonable result out of this, this plan. Uh, but obviously, once they start adding more dimensions, then 10,000 points is actually very few. Right? So if I have five search dimensions, suddenly it doesn't look so good anymore. Thank you. Another question about um, predicting system. Uh, for example, apart from the fail safe system on the bottom, how about the uh, other we didn't see in the communication. Like, for example, it has some problem that the copter cannot receive the signal from the uh, motion counter of low vision system. That's right, so that, that's a big challenge, right? Is, is thinking about this failure tree and then all of the possibilities that might happen. Um, what I talked about here, and most of my time sort of was spent on this, is the mechanical failures. Um, but clearly there are other types of failures as well. Um, so you might imagine what happens if I can't talk to the vehicle, if the vehicle uh, loses its, its measurements. Um, we've done a little bit of work on this. Uh, we have, I have a master's student who's doing sort of a smallish project where we're starting to try and get something off the ground in that direction as well. Um, usually the strategy is you know, try to bring it to a safe state, right? So have a, a, a thing that if I lose communication, I know that there's something I can do that brings me to a safe state as quickly as possible. Uh, with the car that's sort of jumping on the brakes and putting to the side, uh, here it might be just you have always a landing position that you know you can reach. If I lose communication, I'm just going to do that. Right? So that, that might be the way you try to do it. Uh, with respect to the monocopter, it's a highly unnatural system. So how do you exactly decide the hierarchy of control problems that you're solving? So, um, in these experiments, we were doing a cascade controller with two loops. So the inner loop was controlling the attitude, so effectively controlling the thrust direction. And the outer loop, which was slower, was controlling uh, the position using the thrust direction as an input, effectively as an acceleration. Um, that works OK. You have to wave your hands a bit when you're talking about stability and controllability. Um, but we've also done sort of a fully, a full state feedback LQR. Uh, the difference is that it's much, a cascaded control, you can sort of do larger orientations and it's much easier to separate that out from the full state than you rest the controller. Um, but it's less intuitive to break it into parts than with a typical quadcopter, uh, where you can sort of imagine each spatial direction independently like we did with trajectory generation. Now clearly they're very tightly coupled. How do you touch the phone? Okay, fix our copters and the octacopters. Uh, do you think these are uh, uh, but is it controllable? And uh, about the phase, phase safe system, uh, how many rotors can, can they afford the uh, if they fail? So, yeah, in terms of the hexaloctocopters, if there is a failure, you mean if there's a failure, how easy are they to control? Yes. So clearly, if I have an octocopter and I lose, lose one propeller, I effectively have a seven or copter, whatever that's called. Um, and then I can fly it using pretty much the same ideas as I would fly my hexacopter, right? So I can remove two propellers and I have a hexacopter. Uh, so in some sense, that's easier to control and it's less sensitive to things like mass distribution. So you, we saw when we were doing the linearization, these uh, parameters in the matrices were function of the mass distribution and often I don't know this one. Um, so in that sense, it might be easier to still control a, a, an octocopter than a quadcopter. Um, usually the constraint you hit first is not sort of the theoretical, can I control with one propeller, it's can I produce enough thrust to fly. Um, so you imagine these, these drones that were flying uh, in Broadway, uh, they're two independent vehicles, each one has to effectively be able to carry its body home. So each pair of propellers needs to produce at least enough thrust to carry the whole system, plus a little bit extra for controlling uh, around that equilibrium value. 
So you end up with typically quite over-actuated vehicles. And this is fine if you want to do something where agility is important, because then you have all this extra thrust. Um, but if you're just trying to deliver packages, maybe you're wasting a lot of fuel carrying big motors around that you very rarely actually use. So there's sort of an interesting trade-off there. And if you start looking at the power consumption, uh, as you have more propellers, you sort of have larger surface area, which might actually help you reduce the power consumption, even if you add weight to the vehicle. Right? So it's not clear. Um, it's not as easy as perhaps I made it sound that four is always better than eight. Depending on the specific design, you might actually get less power with more propellers simply because you're spreading the load of a larger number of, of propellers. Okay. Is there any more questions? One last one. Have you, have you investigated on uh, similar fail-safe systems for fixed wing aircraft? Um, I have some ideas, but we haven't done anything. So we haven't pushed those ideas in any uh, And the main reason is it's so much more annoying to work with fixed wing aircraft than with these, these small vehicles because you need so much more space. Right? So to do reliable experiments uh, with a fixed wing vehicle, uh, if this thing has to operate at three meters per second, the space I have, I've crossed in two seconds. Right? And, and that's not enough time to do anything interesting. Uh, so that's sort of a big challenge with this. But you can think about using similar ideas uh, in that sense too. And else? Do you know, if, has there been any work done on like changing the actual uh, sort of shape of the aircraft in a failure mode? So if it loses a propeller, you know, maybe the, sh the center of mass could, you know, some like automatic thing that can shift the center of mass so that then you have a, a tricopter that, nice. that doesn't need to be, have some periodic motion to, to stay at altitude. I don't think so. So we're working on some related idea. The challenge always with this is you want to, to trade off the additional complexity that you're adding and yeah. the mass of these actuators and sort of the joints and so on yeah. with the abilities that you get. Now as you start thinking about these ideas, it's kind of interesting because as I have more actuators, I can typically do more interesting maneuvers, failure free already, right? So how much do I get out of this? That's sort of an interesting question. So if I add a certain actuator, it's going to cost me mass that I have to carry around, but does it allow me to do something new? Does it allow me to reject disturbances maybe much better? And then additionally have this failure uh, property that it gives me redundancy uh, if something bad happens elsewhere in the system. Any further questions? Yeah, one more. If not, let's thank Mark. Thank you.